I was born mm, a couple of years ago, and that was in the Bronx, New York, at the hospital on the Grand Concourse. And when I was born, I, my mother told me that I kind of put up a fight and resisted. And, and she had a very long and hard labor. And I can understand that as an adult. I didn't know as a child, obviously, anything about this. But as an adult, I do understand I was in a very nice place. <laughs> Why leave, you know? And I, I haven't changed much since then. When I was born, I was born into a lovely family. My mother and father, God rest their souls, were wonderful people and just happened to be Jewish. And so, unlike a lot of you, I have two birth certificates. So I could be president in two countries, I guess. But, and actually that's true, because all Jews have dual citizenship here and in Israel. But, so my full name is Howard Martin Kerstell, very English sounding, except for the Kerstell. Nobody knows where that came from. It was Ellis Island. My given name in Hebrew, and this is a mouthful, so I'm going to test you on this later. My full name in Hebrew is Chaim Mordechai ben Shmuel Issachar. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> You're supposed to say Gesundheit. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the Chaim translates to life, not Howard. Mordechai was... Esther's brother, and Ben means son of. Shmuel translates to Samuel, which is a biblical name that you're probably all familiar with. And Issachar is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he was the leader of the 12 tribes. Anyway, so that's who I'm supposed to be related to. Uh, after I was born, I grew up. Wow. Yeah, no, I... Not everybody does this. <laughs> and in, in the course of growing up, I was blessed to grow up in a Bronx neighborhood that was predominantly Jewish. And as an example of that, I went to PS 26. That was my elementary school. And in New York, they call public school 26. No name, PS 26, that was it. And there were some 1,500 students or more. I don't quite remember exactly. And on Wednesday afternoons, as in most public schools in New York, the Catholic children would leave at about 2.15 in the afternoon to go across the street to the church and get catechism, all 15 of them. <laughs> That'll give you an idea of the neighborhood. Our neighborhood was not eclectic. <laughs> it was very much focused as a Jewish community. There were, within walking distance, three synagogues. And, by the way, because it is a bunch of Jews, there were also three Chinese restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> That's typical in Jewish neighborhoods in New York. In any event, I lived on a hillside, a fairly steep hill, now, it's not like hills like we have here. These are mountains. These, this is a hill. And the, I, the street name was Phelan Place. Uh, it's a name from New York history. It's spelled P-H-E-L-A-N. Why it's pronounced Phelan, I don't know. But. And down the street, this, the street went like this. And adjoining it, hope you can all see, there was a semicircular street that ran into mine. It was called Billingsley Terrace. Well, right at the juncture of Billingsley Terrace and Phelan Place was my aunt and uncle, my father's brother and sister-in-law, and their two kids lived there. One of them, the younger, was named Richard, and you may have seen his name. He went professionally in later life as M. Richard Kerstell. He was a professional artistic photographer, published several books, taught at Towson University in Maryland, and also had photographs hanging in a museum of modern art, MoMA. So he was very accomplished later. When I knew him, not so much. <laughs> 
He was my cousin, Richie. He would not like to be called that in public. Unfortunately, he has passed on, so he ain't gonna know. <laughs> I'm sneaking that one by. Richie, for some reason, loved my parents' house better than his own. And since we were just a walk up the block, he spent many, many hours there, and he just loved his aunt and uncle, just adored them. I was about nine years younger than Richie, and I adored him. He was, he was my idol as a young boy, because he would go hiking, and he would be involved in all sorts of things, and he'd come and tell us of what was going on in his life, and I was just fascinated. I mean, I was, and I loved him, I idolized him. It was because of him that I learned to like Shakespeare. He, he really loved Shakespeare, and he told me something you probably already know, but he gave me an example of Shakespeare's bawdiness. Shakespeare's bawdiness, not the bard, but the bawd. And for instance, in Hamlet, Hamlet tells Ophelia, get thee to a nunnery. Now in Elizabethan times, a nunnery was indeed a convent nunnery where the sisters lived and people went, women in particular, but it also meant a brothel. <laughs> and if you read that scene, you will see that it could easily be a double entendre. In fact, Shakespeare did a lot of that. Anyway, as a result, I learned about Shakespeare, and by the time I was 13, I'd read his complete works because it was just fascinating. I didn't understand them <laughs> because Elizabethan English is not something easily understood by a 13-year-old. I did read the cliff notes, so I learned a lot about it. Anyway, Richie was my hero. He also loved folk music, which was why professionally when I started singing, I started off as a folk singer. And where was that? That was in the San Francisco Bay Area in the early 60s. <laughs> I won't say much more about that. Uh, my memories are not as accurate as they might be. Don't know why that is. Use your imagination. Anyway, Richie was without a doubt my idol, and I loved him. He took me hiking. We went across George Washington Bridge to Teaneck, New Jersey. This was a big adventure. And went, cooked meals and everything, and in fact, one meal that we cooked was over an open fire, and my steak dropped into the fire. And he blithely picked it up and put it back on the, the Airsats grill that we had. And I looked at him, I said, what, 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 what's, what's this? I, you want me to eat that? He said, Howard, everybody's got to eat a pound of dirt sometime in their life. <laughs> and so that was my beginning of eating dirt. I've, eat, I've eaten lots since. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about my extended family. My father's side of the family, my mother's side, unfortunately, was pretty much wiped out by the Holocaust. My mother was actually born in Częstochowa, Poland, and was an immigrant. And my father's side of the family had been here for a couple of generations, and it was huge. And we used to have family gatherings once a month in the social hall of a synagogue. Well, we're Jewish, you know. And there would be as many as 150 people show up to, to every one of those. And therefore, as a young boy, I learned the difference between a first cousin and a first cousin once removed and a second cousin and a third cousin because I could see these people and I could put identities in where they came from. Most adults I talk to have no clue what a second cousin once removed means. And I'm not gonna explain it now. <laughs> anyway, so these family meetings were large and the family had seen fit to actually become an association. And they did that because we did charitable works as a family. I say we, I was a kid, but they did charitable works and needed some sort of corporate shield. And so 
The actual name of these gatherings was the Associated Kremsdorf Descendants Incorporated. <laughs> well, these meetings would start off, they were standard business meetings, old business, new business, and so forth and so on, run, and this was another thing I learned at a young age, run by the Roberts Rules of Order. And therefore, I did fine in speech and debate later because I knew all about these things. Anyway, the end of these meetings, the end of these meetings, family members would do what I have since found out Japanese people do at weddings. Somebody from the family would stand up and entertain us, either by reading a poem or reciting a poem or doing a soliloquy from theater or singing or telling an amusing story, hopefully. And then when that was all done, we'd go eat dinner. Now let me tie this all together for you. We have my cousin Richard teaching me folk music. We have the associated Kremsdorf descendants with their business meeting. And I was a, I don't know, I guess I was about nine years old when this happened. And my family knew that I had a good voice, a considerably higher voice than I have now. And by the way, just to establish my bona fides as a singer, I'm gonna step back here. Guardi il mare come bello, spiro tanto sentimento, come il tuo suave d'accento, che me desto fa sognar. Senti il nieve come sale de giardino d'or d'aranci. Un profumo non va uguale per chi palpita d'amor e tu dici lo parto a Dio. Dall'andare dal mio cuore questa terra dell'amore hai la forza di lasciar ma non mi fuggir non dormi più tormento torna sorriento non formi Grazie, mille grazie, mille grazie. Anyway, so you, you kind of get the idea that I maybe know a little bit about singing. And, and so at, that, at that point, it wasn't quite as clear cut, but I was a boy soprano. And so the family asked me this one meeting, would I stand up and sing? So I did. Naturally, I was nervous, but I sang. What did I sing? I sang my favorite folk song, Froggy Went a Courtin'. <laughs> that was one that my cousin Richie had taught me. And I stood up and I sang. And when I was through, there was polite applause. I was mortified. I had no idea what it was all about. What's going on? Why did... And somebody in the family, sitting down, listening, said, Howie, did your cousin Richie teach you that song? <laughs> and I was honored, I mean, to know that I had learned this from my cousin whom I idolized and they recognized this and I said, yeah, yeah, and everybody started laughing hysterically. Why? It turns out my cousin Richard was tone deaf. And when I sang, I sang, Froggy went a cordon and he did right, uh-huh, uh-huh, Froggy went a cordon and he did right, uh-huh. Total monotone, because that's what he did. He couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, was my debut in music. <laughs>